got a real star-studded lineup uh, this morning uh, on the topic of the RSA's Food, Farming and Countryside Commission and the report that's recently been published. Uh, so I'm delighted to welcome uh, Sue Pritchard, director of that commission, uh, and two of the commissioners, uh, Helen Browning, who's CEO of the Soil Association, uh, and Dame Fiona Reynolds, a former director general of the National Trust and now master of Emmanuel College. Um, so with that, delighted to hand over to Sue. Thank you, Charlie. It is a real, real pleasure to be here in this place on this occasion. We've had a, a pretty hectic and intense week. We published our report on Tuesday and have had a very um, lovely response to it, a very lively response to it. Um, so it was a bit, of a bit of a wild week last week, so coming here into this space, this restful and restorative space, is a bit of a treat. So we're going to treat this as a, as a bit of a conversation um, between ourselves, but also with you. I'm going to tell you a little bit just to set the scene about the report, how we arrived at the report and the headlines of what the report says. But of course, the real work starts now. The real work starts at the point where we have to create what we started to call a community on a mission to put recommendations into practice. And so that's what we want to probably talk most about today. But just for those of you who have not been following our progress um, over the last two years, the Food Farming and Countryside Commission was established as a result of the foresightedness and courage of a small group of leaders across the farming and food and environment and countryside sectors in the months following the Brexit vote. They realised that this raised some really serious issues for our future as a country and wanted to make sure that we mobilised all the voices that needed to be heard in thinking through how we might respond. They approached Esme Fairbairn Foundation, who were very generous with a, a grant to support the work of the Commission and the RSA um, was chosen as the hosts and then I was appointed to run the Commission. Um, Helen Browning and Fiona Reynolds are two of our fabulous commissions. There are 15 of us all together. It's chaired by Sir Ian Cheshire of Barclays UK. And it's a real cross-section, a real fractal of all of the interests that are part of these conversations from the food sector, from farming, environment, citizens, economists, academics. So we, we kind of created a little fractal amongst the commissioners of all of the different perspectives that we absolutely wanted to hear from. And that was a critical part of our mandate. Our mandate was to help shape a new version of a future for food, farming and countryside that was safe, that was secure, that was sustainable. But also critically, to hear those voices that often do not get heard, don't even get invited into the debate. And then as a result, make some recommendations to government, to business, but also to civic society, to us, to say, what is it that, what, what can we do? What can we just get on and do without waiting for our politics to settle down or for businesses to catch up? And that has felt like a really critical message. So a couple of years ago, it is actually two years ago that I applied for the job and luckily got it because I couldn't think of anything else that I wanted to do more than this job at that time. This felt like exactly the right thing to be doing with exactly the right people. Um, so I was very grateful that the RSA agreed with me on that score. Um, we, we, we set out um, to design a process. And um, we knew that citizen engagement, public involvement was going to be really, really important to us. But given that was a big chunk of my background, I knew that very many of the ways that we do that kind of thing really fall short. It's very often Know, inviting people to come to rather miserable hotel rooms on the outskirts of town at you know, seven o'clock on a Tuesday night when actually what they really want to be doing is watching Corrie or putting the kids to bed. And then when people don't turn up, governments often say, well, they're hard to reach or nobody's interested. <laughs> and and um, I did not believe that to be the case. 
So we decided that we would try and do things a little bit differently, that we would go and find people to talk to them where they are, around the country, in their homes, in their businesses, in their communities, in schools, in all sorts of places. And um, we had one of those moments in the office one day where we were talking about how we might do this. And I said, wouldn't it be great if we just, if we, we just went out on a bike? And we had a little laugh. And then we looked at each other in the team and said, no, actually, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be great if we got on a bike and travelled the UK and went to people, just turned up in people's villages and people's communities to talk to them about what they care about and what matters to them in, in everyday language, not in consult speak, but to say, what, what matters to you? What do you want to tell us about? What works for you? What are you excited by? What are you afraid of? What are you anxious about? And thanks to the brilliant support of commissioners who were as enthusiastic about a radical approach as we were, and thanks to the RSA who kind of swallowed hard and said, I'm sure that sounds just fine. We did just that. We spent nine months travelling the country, 27 researchers on bicycles, and people travelled from Kent to the Highlands. I confess we did go on a plane to the Highlands. We couldn't quite cycle all the way there, or to, or to, to Shetland, rather. We did cycle the Highlands. I had to fly to the Shetland, right across to Northern Ireland, <coughs> down through Wales, into Cornwall, and back to London. And it was a really extraordinary process. It changed our thinking, I think it's fair to say, as commissioners, because the sorts of stories that started to come back from those communities helped us recognise a couple of things. First of all, everybody everywhere felt incredibly distanced from policy making in London, or indeed in Holyrood, or in Stormont, or in, or in Senedd. People felt distant from their governments, they felt distant from policy making. And they felt incredibly anxious about what the future might hold. Not just around Brexit, in fact, that wasn't a topic that came up terribly often. What really mattered to people were things like climate breakdown, um, ecosystem breakdown, the loss of wildlife, but also the, the fragility of the rural communities that they loved and that they wanted to live and work in, but were starting to struggle to find ways of being able to do that or for their children to stay, to look after older people in communities that were becoming more and more fragile. And so those, that travel shaped the work of the Commission. We also engaged in six long-term, deep inquiries, three in England and then three in the devolved nations, in Devon and in Lincolnshire and in Cumbria, and then in Wales, Northern Ireland and in Scotland. And in all of those, we convened leadership communities. We, we, we convened a leadership group from people who were already doing good things in that part of the world. And again, we said, what is it that you want to, what is it, what is it that you want to tell us? What feels really important to you in this place? And that allowed those inquiries to develop actually quite, quite differently. In Devon, unsurprisingly, we heard a lot about grasslands, the importance of grasslands in farming. But we also heard about farmer mental health, because people there had stories of the, the distress that farming communities and farming families were starting to feel with all of the uncertainty. In Cumbria, in contrast, when we showed up there, their response was a little bit different. They said, do you know, we get a bit fed up of people turning up to ask us what we think in Cumbria. Everybody wants to know what's going on in Cumbria. And now it's, it's just really boring. We turn up at these events, we participate, and then nothing happens. So we would be really curious to know what happens to all of that stuff that we keep telling people. And so that's what we did. We worked with the Cumbrian community to say, well, let's, let's map for you all of the different initiatives that are happening around food, around farming, around rural futures. And let's show you what's going on in your area. And let's work with you to develop a response that says, does this work or doesn't it? And if it needs to change, how could it change? All of those stories 
were collected in this particular volume called Fork in the Road, we were so touched by the quality of people's engagement with us and people's conversations with us that we wanted to honour them, actually. This, this wasn't part of our original brief, but it felt really important to show in, um, in frankly, a quite beautiful way. So I'm very pleased with the production quality of this particular document. What people were already doing, what people were talking about, what people wanted us to know. So that was one big chunk of our work. And then, of course, we did what inquiries usually do, which is look at the evidence, review proposals. We reviewed over a thousand policy proposals and we put out calls for ideas and we got lots of responses, probably from some folk in this room. In fact, I know from some folk in this room. And we asked, given this is what the policy landscape looks like currently, what's not being said? What's not getting the right priority? Is there anything that you want to tell us that you think is not getting the attention it deserves? And we got some really, really lovely, lovely responses to that. And then through the summer last year and through the winter and spring, we held a whole series of round tables and meetings and events around the country with policymakers. And that led us to produce our final report, which got launched just last week. We came to three big headline sets of recommendations with a number of policy proposals underneath them. And the first we've labelled healthy food is everybody's business. The, the prescience of um, the people who formed the commission, and Helen was um, at the forefront of that, made sure that we involved as part of the commission people who represented public health. So Shirley Kramer and David Pension, one a doctor, one the chief exec of the Royal Society for Public Health, were our commissioners, and really challenged us to look hard at the impact of our food and farming system on people's public health. And it became clear to us that we didn't just have a climate and ecosystem crisis to deal with, we had a public health crisis to deal with. So our food and farming system needed to be transformed, not just for the planet, but for people and people's health too. So our first set of recommendations are about food, labelled healthy food is everybody's business. The second set of recommendations are about farming. One of the things that we discovered fairly quickly as we travelled around the country was that farmers are enormously anxious about the future, but that they're all also already doing incredible things. And it's in this volume of our report, The Field Guide for the Future, where we've captured lots of stories of the amazing things that farmers and growers are already doing around the country to transform the way that the food and farming system operates without any of the policy um, conditions that we recommend in here. So this is a really, really inspiring piece. But what became really important to us was to acknowledge that farming can be, in fact must be, the force for change. So our second block of recommendations called Farming is a force for change and it's time for the fourth agricultural revolution. But we mean something perhaps a little bit different to the way that the fourth agricultural revolution gets talked about in some quarters. We're very clearly calling for the fourth agricultural revolution <coughs> excuse me, towards an agroecological future. <coughs> we can talk a bit more about that too. And then the, the third bucket of recommendations is about rural communities and the countryside. <coughs> it's clear to us that the countryside has to be at the heart of the regenerative economy and a regenerative future. If the countryside is not working, then so many of these recommendations simply can't happen. So in there, we talk about a framework for land use, we talk about work for the regenerative economy, we talk about affordable and sustainable housing, and we also talk a little bit about what we call a national nature service to mobilise people to do the work that needs to be done. So in all of that, the most important thing is recognising that, as my grandmother would have said to me, fine words butter no parsnips. Mm -hmm. and, and she's, of course, absolutely right. And so now we're focused on what needs to happen next. I'm going to bring in my wonderful colleague commissioners to... Uh, to say a bit more about, I think we'll probably start with 
we'll, we'll start from the top with the with the food and the farming recommendations so Helen as a as a grower and chief executive of the soil association and a pig farmer some of you will be able to join her later on today when she talks about her her pigs has a real <laughs> has a real you, you have a real real visceral sense don't you of how this feels how it feels to be um, a grower a farmer who is trying to produce the healthiest food possible for us so tell us a bit more about how that shaped our recommendations and what we what we think everyone should do thank you sue i i mean i i feel that farmers feel pretty beleaguered at the moment yeah. actually i mean we're, we're facing um so much uncertainty if you look at not just brexit and the potential for all these ghastly trade deals that will undermine uh, the higher standards we've managed to achieve, they're not, not high enough, but you know, we're, we're ahead of the game in, in so many areas compared to what the Americans are doing or whatever. Um, nobody's got a clue really what the support arrangements, if any, will look like uh, post-Brexit. Markets are shifting all the time. Um, and uh, I think it's very hard for farmers to plan. And I think one of the things that shocked me so much um, during our work was was the issue of stress and, and mental ill health amongst the farming community mm. so much more pervasive than I think I'd really recognised. I think farmers are very isolated, um, often uh, feeling quite done to. Um, and so overall, there was a sense that, you know, we've got, to, we've got to change that whole culture in the farming community. Farmers do need to be um, in the driving seat of change, to be properly involved in the decisions that will shape their futures. We found that farmers actually really were up for change. Hmm. Um, and uh, the kind of things we were talking about, which, you know, 10 years ago might have felt quite, uh, you know, quite scary to them, the idea of moving away from using lots of pesticides to actually really trying to minimize pesticide use and moving into a, an agroecological and more organic future. Um, you know, 10 years ago would have had a huge mm. kickback. Mm. But I think now it's about well, how do we do that? What, did, what support do we need to get there? We're not confident about our knowledge. We're not confident about the markets out there for our produce. Um, and yet we're up for that. If you can, if we can create uh, the economic and regulatory and advisory community around us, uh, the framework around us to allow us to, to, to move, at a sensible pace into that future. Um, and so, you know, I think there was a sense of both uh, real nervousness about where the farming community is today, the risks that there are if we don't get this right over the next few years. I mean, you know, a, a no deal Brexit could be absolutely catastrophic mm -hmm. for huge uh, tranches of our mm -hmm. farming, uh, farming community. Um, but a, a, a sort of sense that there was some brilliant stuff happening out there. When we looked yeah. at some of the initiatives around health, for instance, and farmers starting to grow new crops, growing nuts and fruits and, you know, uh, pulses and creating new types of products, all mm -hmm. sorts of brilliant stuff uh, starting to happen. Mm -hmm. But we really need to, 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 to give them an environment in which those things can fri thrive and we can build on yeah. uh, those kind of uh, initiatives. Yeah, brilliant. And I think I'm rather proud of the fact that we were quite bold about challenging the current food system on those really um, unhealthy and um, uh, broken practices. And our whole tranche of recommendations that we call levelling the playing field, where we are pointing to the disparity in investment on, for example, you know, advertising junk foods compared to what government can spend on public health campaigns, you know, 200%. What was it 200 no 200 times yeah. 200 times more you know, hugely more and uh, and how hard it is for local councils to regulate against uh, junk food on high streets so we I, I'm, I'm quite proud of the fact that we confronted those um, you know the, those current practices really quite hard and I know that uh, our public health coll colleagues were pretty pleased with that. Were you, were you pleased to see us be bold there? Yes, I mean, I think through all our work at the Soil Association, through our Food for Life yeah. uh, programme, for instance, we've, be, be, we've been so aware of how hard it is for people to, have, uh, to be able to make the right choices about mm. what they eat. Uh, they don't have the options in many places. You've seen you know, high streets in many 
less privileged communities turn into fried chicken shops, betting shops and tanning shops. You know, that's what's on the high street. And it's incredibly hard for people to access healthier foods. Um, mm. And uh, as you say, the spend on luring us into eating the wrong things mm. is so much higher than it is uh, supporting us to do the right stuff. Mm. Um, something like over 50% of the food we eat in England now is ultra processed. Mm -hmm. Uh, compared to something like 14% in France. So we are being marketed at all the time as consumers rather than treated as citizens We're, and creating a food system which actually enables us to live well. Um, and actually, I think the same thing happens in the farming community as well, where mm -hmm. we are constantly being told, you need this product or you need that product, you mm -hmm. can't actually, yeah. you know, we are all treated as consumers. Yeah rather than as active citizens. Um, mm. And we need to shape our food system so differently to make mm. it easier to do the right thing and mm. much harder to do the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. And Fiona, your, your passion is mm. land and rural communities and what land means to us. Do you think we've got the balance right between um, you know, standing up for you know, a less instrumental view of land and recognising the importance of living, working, thriving, flourishing rural communities? I think self-evidently, no, we haven't at the moment got the balance right at all. Mm. In fact, you mm. talked about three crises, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis mm. and the public health crisis. Mm. And yet the two areas that we dwell on mm. in the last section of our report are both completely... Um, in chaos in terms of public policy. One mm. is the land and the other is actually rural policy itself where, to take the latter first, rural, rural policy is the sort of, you know, the detritus, as it were, of what's left when the focus has been on urban communities, even the way we manage the public health service or the way mm. we think about education or the way we think about mm. many, many things you know, are, are designed around the needs of urban communities. Mm. And we, we heard so often that rural communities feel left out, abandoned, they can't get the housing they need, no one's investing, the jobs aren't there, young people move <coughs> away, all of these. Mm. And yet, and this comes back to the first point, all of society, all of life, all of our long-term future depends on the land. And we are wasteful, um, inconsistent, siloed in our approach to the land. And so we found so many examples of where because we don't think strategically about land use. And land use both as food producer, but also where our water's collected, also where spaces we need to, whether it's building houses or infrastructure, where people live, um, the need that that's how beauty and biodiversity and wildlife thrive. The land delivers all these things, and mm. we yet have public policy going, oh, no, 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 we don't want to have a land use policy in this country. And as a result, we have chaos. We have... We're building houses on the floodplain. We can't get big initiatives like new tree planting going because there's no strategic context. Farming, as Helen's described, is so very, very instrumental and has been pr productivity focused for so long uh, with just tiny little um, good, good practice and glimmers mm. of, of, of good things going on, but no strategic yeah. framework for that. Nothing mm. about, well, we grow grass well in this country, as you've mm. already said. Mm. How can we really sustain mm. the grasslands of the west, southwest of, mm. of England and do, mm. do something really remarkable for biodiversity, for people, for food mm. production with it? Mm. So we, had, we, we were left with it was, it was such, such mm. a bad framework. And I think what we've come up with and some really exciting possibilities. So first of all, we have said to government, we do need a strategic framework for land. And that's not, that's not going to be easy to deliver, but I think yeah. we're very determined that this time, against this background of chaos, we must, must make a difference. We must invest in our rural areas in ways that are meaningful for rural areas, where there are jobs, and there are good jobs in the right mm. kind of farming. There mm. are good jobs in food processing for sustainable, healthy foods. There are good opportunities for people to be employed in rewarding mm -hmm. jobs. Mm -hmm. they, they, we need broadband, we need all of these things, but we, we need to think rural mm -hmm. in the way that we deliver those. Mm -hmm. And I think we also believe very, very strongly that we need to get rural housing right. Um, many of you will know what a crisis that is, and yet I think we have a figure in our report that if every village in the country took just 10, ten mm -hmm. new houses, actually we would solve the need, and yet we're in this position where it's not about 10 new houses, it's about a great big new housing estate sort of on the edge of 
you know, a settlement and, and everyone gets anxious about it. And then finally, this lovely idea about a national nature service, particularly aimed at young people, and harnessing all that enthusiasm and all that passion mm -hmm. for wildlife and for the countryside, mm -hmm. uh, which we heard all over the place, yeah. particularly from young people, but not just yeah. from young people, yeah. to get out and, and, and know mm -hmm. how they can do something, mm -hmm. whether through volunteering or through mm -hmm. structured engagement in projects mm -hmm. that are, many organisations are running and mm -hmm. desperately want help. So it did mm -hmm. feel to us as though these two big lacuna in public policy, mm -hmm. rural policy itself mm. and our lack of strategic attention to the land mm. there are so many gains mm. that we need to make progress on yeah I think there was a lovely illustration of the way that we tried to go about our work so we we did talk about the big policy recommendations that we think are required the land use framework is, is is one such but we also worked with people in towns in villages mm -hmm. in rural communities to say well, what, what, would, what would you need right now yeah. to make life um, more straightforward mm -hmm. and um, more regenerative? And I think um, we do that not just because you know, working with the top and in communities at the grassroots is always a good thing to do, but I think um, we realise that we don't have much time to deal with the challenges that are in front of us. And, uh, and as I've chatted with, with Mike Berners-Lee on more than one occasion. Um, there is no planet B, but we do need, I think, a plan B for resilient communities who are able to flourish whatever, whatever happens. And so there's a whole pile of our recommendations. You might call them our stealth recommendations, which say this is what we need to do to build resilient communities that can flourish whatever happens next. Should we take some questions? Yeah, Should we hear from absolutely. folk? I just, I, I just love your purple hat. I just, if I have a hat today, I want a purple hat. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> That's Glastonbury for you. Um, I'm fascinated by this idea of, um, of how we need to embrace all of these issues that happen in rural communities. So obviously Glastonbury sits in on the edge of the levels. It, yeah. it has this uh, historic, great history of reclaimed land from the water. But um, <coughs> there's a thing happening around there at the moment which seems to be kind of around... The, 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 what I'm seeing is a strategy of gentrification. So it doesn't matter where you are. What seems to be happening is th things come along where there's an expansion in, of some form. And it seems to start always with transport. So there's a bypass mm -hmm. plan for uh, Glastonbury and the surrounding area. Mm. And I think um, what, tends, what I've seen happening across um, the country in, in various places is you get some sort of transport expansion like a road and then what happens is the industry kind of follows it so they say mm -hmm. um, we'll create some space for an industrial park, uh, oh then we'll create some space for some new housing. And, and then what happens is that sort of you get this, this urbanisation even in rural areas where there's just this mm -hmm. formula of <coughs> roads, yeah. industry, housing, services, commercialization. Mm -hmm. So you get these industrial parks which yeah. just look blanket the same no matter where you go yeah. and they always offer the same poor quality yeah. commercial Absolutely. stuff. And as you say, yeah. nobody's being inspired to actually do it differently. Yeah. And the, the place where I most poignantly noticed that personally was with housing. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> excuse me, um, it was basically about the low quality of housing that, that is being made, that, that yeah. the, the government has done well to push it to uh, private places, i.e. housing associations, mm -hmm. which are regulated but still private in their nature. So they have like a cap to their profit, but they still mm -hmm. do make profit from that to mm -hmm. keep the wheels turning in, in the housing associations. But the quality of what's being built and yeah. the socialization of the people who live there yeah and the methods through which, the mechanism through which they do that is actually about control and not really about encouraging people to be good responsible citizens but more about just saying if you don't behave well we'll punish you by throwing you out or something you know so it's sort of the low level control of housing also seems to affect the way that you know the houses are built they're just not built with any imagination they say they're eco-friendly but that just means they stuff twice as much insulation in the roof and it, it hits targets, but it isn't actually really addressing the real yeah. issues, which is where's yeah. the imagination, where's the yeah. pride 
in what we do as a country or what we do as a government, what we do as a service or how we provide things for people, mm -hmm. there's no aspiration to do better. There's no aspiration mm -hmm. to provide more ecological yeah. housing, yeah. better community environments and so on and yeah. so forth. So yeah. the question is, how do we deal with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, we, we feel you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we spent um, quite a bit of time pondering that in the Commission, but also contributing to the House of Lords Select Committee on the Rural Economy, who also recognises all of those issues. Mm. And uh, without getting into all the, the details, what we've highlighted in our report are the really inadequate arrangements for making those sorts of decisions. At the moment, an enormous amount of industrial investment is directed through the LEPs, which even in rural areas are actually quite urban in their focus mm -hmm. and divorced from um, local democratic arrangements. So we've got some recommendations in our report that, I mean, they, they feel quite policy wonky, but actually I think they are quite important because they interrupt the current direction of travel and bring uh, rurality and regeneration at the heart of every LEP, whether it's in the countryside or not, by connecting them with local nature partnerships and their democratic local arrangements. Um, and we've, we've got some plans to host a number of summits on that topic over the next few months because um, the way the arrangements are at the moment are giving us exactly that situation that you described. Did you want to say something? To well, very me? briefly, I don't, do I need the mic? Just very briefly to say, I mean, there's a lot of work going on this outside of our commission, mm -hmm. another commission mm -hmm. I'm on as well. But I think yes. the main point I'd make is that we've got to be better at place making. Yes. And we identify in the report that, you know, every place you know, it has its character, has its future, has its future in sustainably based local businesses. And that gives you, and should give you, a different outcome for each place. You know, houses in the right place of the right design, of the right quality, meeting the need that is there in that place, not mm -hmm. superimposed. Here's a bypass, here's a space for industry, here's a space for housing, mm -hmm. and just never mind what gets built. So like it's example. turning the telescope around to be mm -hmm. organic um, from the bottom up, place based citizen involvement in shaping your future and that is coming from many different places so we're not alone it's not happening but we're not alone in that voice let's get some more questions yeah. um, we've got 10 minutes left are you all able to stay after the end mm. yeah uh, so uh, we need to end at quarter two so at quarter two there'll be a sort of gathering for conversation out yeah. here yeah. well I'm going to suggest yeah. we're going to take two or three, three yeah. questions so Keep them pretty one, short, two, three. and then it's probably over to sort of yes. concluding remarks at that you point. You can be in charge of the microphone, um, Charlie. My question is how to turn your vision for regenerative, agroecological, resilient farming and local communities into action. Very good and I have particularly in mind the young farmers in this room, in case Fredericks, our Oak Brook farmer here, who's pioneered a a micro dairy who's had to go out with his baby son. Ah, yeah. Is he still here? Yeah. Getting a right. message. I'll have the baby. So Case, <laughs> Case, has, a, Case has a vision of 20, 12 rural jobs on Oak Brook Farm, which is owned by the Biodynamic Land Trust, that's Gabriel here, um, to crea create farmer access. Now, just, just how can we upscale the Stroud method, okay? Mm -hmm. So thanks to the Soil Associations, Greg Pilly and Jade Bashford coming in 2003 to a Land for People conference, Stroud Community Agriculture, which is a co-op of 30, 375 members that farms this land here, is successful. Technical assistance plus lottery funding, and now there's several hundred nationally. So thanks, Soil Association. Secondly, we developed community land trusts with a national partnership in Stroud Commonwealth, and now there's 350. And our vision is a community land trust in every parish, mm. in every village, okay. to capture the value of land for <coughs> rural mm. communities and facilitate mm. land use policy. And thirdly, um, <coughs> we're developing these, uh, we're trying to develop farms like Oakbrook Farm as, as agroecological agro incubators um, of farm businesses, but we need technical assistance, good technical assistance. We need funding, we need a lottery funding. So my question to you is, with your elite, can I use the word elite? 
Black. Is that okay? With all your connections. I'm from the Rhondda Valley. I don't feel very elite. <laughs> okay. <touch> <laughs> With all your connections, can you, can you facilitate the development of funds, such as a lottery fund, for resilient local community development and resilient regenerative farming development? Because what, what we need is technical assistance so could, and we need, need funds. I'm sorry, so, so my question yeah, is yeah, how yeah, to turn the vision into yeah, action? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what's your take on that? Yeah. Uh, so I, I feel this is difficult because what I heard you've done is gone out into communities and had these kind mm. of conversations, which is what we all long mm. for, but we also have a clock ticking. Yeah. So I'm just going to ask, who's got a short question? <laughs> um, have you got a short question? So my question is, how do you turn farmers from consumers into um, stewards or guardians of the land and producers of good food? Great. Any yeah. other short questions? Um, I'm sure there's a lot. There's a lot of expertise in the room, so there's also yeah. a conversation you yeah. can have out yeah. there afterwards. How do you get the government on board? Yeah, good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In, in terms of um, rural um, development, um, farmsteads into offices and um, workshops. Should we be doing more live work units in the countryside because then those people become part mm. of the community yeah. rather than people who commute in and commute out? Yes. So, shall, shall I we quickly go yes to that? I'm going to mention the National Agroecology Development Bank, which, uh, and then Helen can talk about innovation and support with technical advice. We absolutely recognise that there's not enough finance in the system to support agroecology. Banks tell us they're more than happy to lend for a massive great tractor or a great new dairy but they're not especially keen or they don't they don't even have a way of thinking about how to invest in helping farmers do less and transition out of the business models that they're locked into and that they want to move to so one of our proposals is a national agroecology development bank that will mobilize the finance to back this transition so we're absolutely clear that when we talk about a transition to agroecology ec we imagine a fair and a just transition that helps people uh, disinvest from what they have done in the past or helps new people come in with the right um, support to do the sorts of things that we've been talking about. Helen, do you want to say something about the advice? And yes, I, I, I mean, I can't, you know, we can't cover everything that needs to happen uh, in the next two minutes, but I think one, one area which, which brings together two of the questions is that of uh, advice and support. Um, so over half of the advice that farmers currently get is from chemical companies or uh, agricultural input companies that are trying to tell them, sell them something. <coughs> it was one of the reasons I went organic, because I was just fed up with everybody trying to sell me something uh, that was going to improve my yields by X or Y. So we do need unbiased, uh, good advice. Uh, to farmers and we know that farmers actually respond best to other farmers um, so we'd like to train and make sure that farmers can spread their advice by uh, having uh, support themselves in doing that well and making sure there's that you know unbiased network of farmers who can share what they've learned and not just support on the technical and business side but also actually uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the mental health side too. Actually, mm -hmm. farmers quite often need somebody to talk to. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a lot to do there on the advisory front, um, mm -hmm. as well as uh, things yeah. like uh, farmer-led research, putting yeah. farmers at the driving seat of their own uh, research rather than just it all happening by men in white coats over here. Again, usually trying to sell us something rather than yeah. using the resources on our own farm and being supported to do our own uh, research and advice well. Yeah. I'm going to pick up the government and a bit about the rural economy because actually I think they're linked. I mean, we heard many farmers tell us, look, you tell us what society wants from us and we will yeah. do it if the money's there and the policy's right. We've just been doing what we've been told to do in this post-war policy, which is to grow lots more and to put lots more pesticides and fertilisers on the land. And actually we heard that particularly from upland farmers, mm. which for me, with my background in national parks and the hills, has been kind of very heartwarming because many of them don't want to farm in the way they have been encouraged to farm. So I think it, this links back to your question, how do we get the nurse to get the government? Well, I've never heard, I mean, Michael Gove may not be in the government in a few days' time, this no, is true. Well, yeah. I think it's, but nevertheless, <laughs> we have on record about the warmest response from a government minister than I've heard in a long time 
We've also been plugging into other government departments because it's not just about DEFRA. And I think we've had incredible positive response. And so I mean, that's mm. uh, and, and, and all across parties. all parties. All, parties, all yes. the parties have gone on record as saying fantastic. Now that again, it's fine words, but I know parsnips. My grandmother said that too. <laughs> but nevertheless, I think that is an amazing platform. The other thing is we're not going away as a commission. We have got a few months more funding, and you've got the impression by now that Sue's quite a tenacious woman. <laughs> and, you know, we're not going to let go. We are about to enter into the most volatile environment, you know, the policy, public policy, and we need good news. And I think this report contains good news for society, for mm -hmm. people, for the future of the planet, mm -hmm. for the future of wildlife mm -hmm. and the countryside. And so, actually, the chance to engage politics in something that is not about Brexit mm. and is about, mm. is of course a bit about Brexit, but, mm. but is about the, just the future of our world, I yeah. think is incredibly exciting. Yeah. And that comes back to my final point about living and working in the countryside rather than just commuting in. That's one example of many in which actually we are saying to people, this isn't just about the government. This is about us and how we live our yes. lives and how we choose. Yes. And actually, we can make... And look at us today. I thought I brought my cup, and when Helen asked me for it, I couldn't find it, so I failed, you know, without even starting. But we were all asked to be a bit more sustainable yeah. today and think about what we're doing. Actually, it's about us as well as the government. And if we all took a leadership role from this festival and Hawkwood and all that it stands for, and many... I can see people in this room who are personally, passionately committed to all of this... This is a big part of it. It's about citizens taking charge of our collective future as well as the government giving the leadership that we need. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and let's not forget that the very reason that government is paying much more attention to these sorts of conversations is the power of citizen advocacy and citizen assembling and citizen organising. Politicians feel much, much braver when they think they're doing what the citizens want them to do. So the more we mobilise, the more we act, the more we speak up what we want from our politicians, the easier they will find it to respond. I think we need to wrap it up. Have you got one yeah. well, last I think thing? I, just one thing to say, which I, I, the, the, one of the reasons why doing something in a neutral space, not one organisation mm. or one individual can hold the ring that we need to have here. So for me, one of the reasons this commission was so important is it's not owned by any of us. It is a common script, a developing common narrative. And the more we can get people signing up, as it were, to that same common narrative, which is co-owned by all of us, and which we continue to build on and design further, then we've got some sort of chance. But if we just keep going back into our silos, and our interest groups, we won't achieve the change that we need to see. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Thank well you. Well um, yeah. I mean, I feel immensely encouraged. Uh, we have here sort of representative of what I wouldn't call elite organisations, but I would call establishment organisations. How long has the RSA been around? 250 uh, two, years? 270. 270 yeah. years. Uh -huh. So I do find it encouraging my sense of uh, sort of the heart. I haven't been around that whole time. You have. <laughs> 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 That for me, the sense of heart and, and sort of wisdom that has clearly gone into this process uh, and, and you as representatives of your institutions taking forward that torch. And I know there are many others like you out there. So thank you for the work you do. You. Uh, and thank you for supporting this event. Thank you.